Take your laurels, Caesar and Homer. Nay, I am no poet nor prince. I am known and own a style and state of my own because I do not feign truth. For I portray Aretino, censor of the proud world, and nuncio and prophet of truth. Here virtue wears a countenance of good cheer. Mark what the hand of Titian has unfurled. But if vice you adore, vice you should fear. Shut your eyes and shun my face forevermore. For though I be painted, I speak, I hear. Federico Gonzaga I adore and Signor Giovanni yet I revere. But beyond these, I honor no man more. With this sonnet, Aretino signed his portrait by Titian and proclaimed his mission to the world. The poet and the painter were working hand in hand to produce a new prophet. New times were at hand, and the new lawgiver, who was rising to confound Italy, only needed to reach Venice and meet Titian to be heard from. A year after reaching the lagoon, he formally settled, severed his last tie with the mainland. He offered a horse, which he had abandoned in Mantua, to a friend. I give the nag gladly, he explained with his customary generosity, and I expect you to accept it in the same spirit. If you must offer me something in return, wait till I leave and offer me another. But you shall wait long, for I have determined to live here forever. A man who cannot live in paradise is a fool. If paradise was a place where he could be himself, he had found it. Our country is where we are welcome, he declared, and he adopted the city and made it his state of sovereign independence. In Venice, where the sun warms all alike, the moon gives light and the stars shine for everyone, he could live his life and speak his mind as he pleased. There he could call his soul his own, and there he found a foothold for his long, transfiguring flight. There was only one drawback. When he reached the lagoon in March 1527, he was a beggar on horseback. He dismounted and embarked, destitute, footloose, and friendless, for in Venice he had no connections. With only the parting gifts of the Marquis between him and the fluctuating gutters of paradise, he could not call his soul his own until he had won material independence. His newfound freedom was dear to him, and to sell his soul to the service of princes was inconsistent with his newfound principles, but there was one service in Venice which he could enter with a clean conscience and a margin of profit. He was an artist, Manke. That was all, perhaps, that stood between him and a soul. Art was the one thing in the world he revered more than the memory of Giovanni de' Medici. As a boy, he had practiced it. In his first year of vagabondage, he had dabbled in painting in Perugia. At the end of that term, learning that art was long and life was short, he threw up the brush, but he had learned enough to appreciate art. In Rome, he frequented the best masters, picked up the lingo of the studios, trained his eye, and became as conversant with the secrets of the craft as with those of the Vatican. His passionate love of paint, combined with his technical knowledge and his journalistic verve, gave him every qualification for a critic, an agent, or a dealer. And the time had now come to exert his powers. In that supreme hour, when the sack of Rome had exhausted the religious, political, and social life of Italy, only one faith remained, the real religion of Italy, the impulse which the Renaissance had been laboring all, all, all along, was the deathless passion of art. The real religion of Italy, the impulse with which the Renaissance had been laboring all along, was the deathless passion of art. It rose from the ruins and followed the fugitive life of Italy to Venice, and there it found refuge in the genius of Titian. The genius of Aretino was his quick instinct for the times, and to Titian he turned his own talents. 
The fame of the great painter was still parochial and that of the great claqueur was cosmopolitan. Titian was impressed by it. Susceptible to the glamour of the mainland, he concluded a covenant with the plausible poet. They agreed to collaborate, Aretino to receive, in return for his pen and his connections abroad, a half share of the commissions he procured for the painter. The graft prospered. Within three months of his arrival in Venice, he was in a position to offer Federico Gonzaga, with whom he promptly renewed relations, two portraits by Titian, one sacred subject by Sebastiano del Piombo, not at all depressing, without hypocrisy, stigmata, or nails, and a Venus by Sansovino, which would make his mouth water. One client led to another, and he was launched. But it was more than a living that Aretino drew from Titian. It was a soul. Titian was the painter that he might have been, had life not been so short. And Aretino served him as a model and a mentor. They were kindred spirits, and between them they shared, half and half, the soul of the dying Renaissance. In Venice, at least, there was no sign that the age was dying. Never had life been more lush there, and celebrating it unanimously, they inspired each other. Aretino divined in Titian what Titian discerned in him, the soul of matter. The painter was fascinated by a model who excited all his powers, because he himself possessed them so abundantly, veracity, voluptuousness, virtuosity. The poet vied with his sanguine virtues, for he had lost his famished look of his Roman days, the braggart stoop and the cutthroat scowl, and was putting on fat, and his fat was a revelation. He now wore a countenance of good cheer, which manifested his virtue. Again and again, Titian returned to that portly figure, breathing before him like a living boon, never satisfied that he had plumbed the secret of its broad bravura, its superabundant vitality, and its jovial aroma. He painted everything but the smell of the man, but the smell was the soul, and it was lush and elusive. In portrait after portrait, the painter studied that imposing presence, so substantial and so hollow, and those brilliant eyes, so candid and sane, but without questions or qualms, searching them for the soul of matter. For who could say that a man so triumphantly alive was soulless, or that if he were hollow, that was not the ultimate truth of which he was the prophet. But he was baffled by his own genius. While the painter ennobled, the prophet glorified matter, and when the sitting was over, the model became a mentor. Their tastes were congenial. Both loved generous wines and generous women, succulent food and succulent gossip, high living and low life. In the orbit of their favorite haunts, the advent of one was invariably followed by the approach of the other. And over the table, Aretino taught Titian. Lying back in jovial digestion, the prophet fathomed his mystery and divulged his virtue, and not merely his abandoned gestures and his honest eyes, but his sanguine smell manifested his unquestioning faith that life was enough. The soul and the flesh were one and indissoluble, but for the complete revelation of one, the perfect satisfaction of the other was essential, and with such prodigal habits and an irregular income, Aretino found it necessary to supplement the service of art with other resources. A day came when he reluctantly compromised with his principles and returned, eh, temporarily, to the service of princes. Having determined on the step he took it boldly. He wrote to Federico Gonzaga, proposing to immortalize him and his breed in an epic poem. He had no opinion of himself as a poet and less of Federico as a prince, but there was no need for Federico to know that. Those were trade secrets. As a poet, he could always help himself to the Orlando Furioso of Ariosto, who had performed a like service for the, for the Este, and who was the poet he might have been had he not been the prophet of Paschino. Accordingly, he borrowed the title of his poem, Marfisa, and the general scheme and frank emulation of his purpose. The scheme was fabulous and bore only the most remote relation to reality, 
And as he drafted it, he realized that his idea was inspired. The Orlando was a supreme example of the romantic literature of escape, and he would improve on Ariosto with a mock epic and confer on the Marquis a mock immortality. In that medium, the poet of Pasquino was a past master. If ever a prince needed a poet, it was Federico Gonzaga, who had foiled Giovanni d'Italia. His inglorious neutrality cried for apotheosis, and it was with a calm conscience that Aretino reached for the laurels he had laid on the tomb of the hero. He was the poet his patron deserved, and there was no truth without hypocrisy. Necessity never mothered a more useful invention. The Marquis snatched up the bait by return post. He burned to see the beginning and the end of his epic. And though the bard labored spinning cantos so profusely that he was soon lost in their confusion, yet he labored Penelope-like to ward off the suitor. Writing at a rate which outran his ideas, he was in no haste to be done. And while he labored, he lived at ease. The Marquis refused him nothing. He collaborated in every conceivable way. He sent him an amanuensis to sort and copy his cantos. He furnished a detailed genealogy of the Gonzagas. He supplied him with money, with damasks, with wines, with hampers of delicacies. He went further. Aretino remembered a lad in Mantua and begged the Marquis to sound him. The Marquis replied that, finding the youth reluctant, he did not feel it, quote, decent or just to command him, unquote, and regretted his inability to oblige his poet. But, as it happened, he did him a service. Aretino then remembered a Mantuan lady by the name of Isabella Sforza, and this time he congratulated himself on the result and, turning over a new leaf, wrote, be it known hereby unto everyone how Isabella Sforza has converted Aretino, who was born perverted, which St. Francis himself could not have done. And the epic progressed. With his progress, Aretino became sincerely inspired. Though his foot tapped the floor like a pedal as he labored the muse, he found a moral satisfaction in his drudgery. He was accomplishing his mission. The Marquis was a symptom of his generation, and the alacrity with which he accepted his bid for glory was not ludicrous, it was tragic. He craved what he needed. For this generation, life was enough, and this meretricious glory. Sapped of religious faith, politically disrupted, dominated by the barbarian, Italy was demoralized and the deepening despair of its society was manifest like a phosphorescence of decay in its lust for fame. Fame, no matter how venal, fame at any price, fame, however fictitious, an hour's fame before the night. And the scourge of princes was there to peddle it. He was fulfilling his function, and it was with the intimate satisfaction of a leech that he catered to his patron. He, at least, was true to himself as he labored like a Homeric humbug, only half hearing under his tapping foot the steady lapping of the iridescent gutters of Venice, and only when the muse slumbered did he smell them. Then, suddenly, there was a hiatus. His pension stopped. And for eight months, the Marquis neither wrote nor replied to his letters. There was no explanation. His patron was completely irresponsible, and Aretino was outraged. Just as he had won a foothold in Venice and was beginning to establish himself, the ground gave under his feet. Not only his mission, but his existence was endangered. And feeling himself slip toward the gutter, he felt as fictitious as Federico Gonzaga. He protested, he complained, he wrote, he fumed, he sulked, and in vain, he threw up the epic 
He resumed it. He dropped it resoundingly, but to no purpose. He threatened to emigrate. And when he was ignored, he strode to the French ambassador and opened negotiations for a pension in France. Then his heart failed him. Whenever he passed through the port with its crowded shipping, his feet dragged, the plying ferries, the swarming gondolas, the argosies rocking on the lagoon, the pinnaces fleeting in the, if I, the the pinnaces fleeting in the estuary made him homesick. He muttered and made motions, but he knew that he would never embark. He preferred to perish in paradise, even if he had chosen a fool's paradise. Life was enough in Venice, and elsewhere it was too much. He called the gondola and lounged on the buoyant heave of the watery floor and cursed his luck and counted the months he had wasted in the service of Federico Gonzaga. And suddenly he remembered that it was time for his almanac. He compiled it overnight. And in the Judizio of Pietro Aretino for the year 1529, there was no mention of the existence of a Marquis of Mantua. He sent it at once to the Mantuan ambassador with his permission to copy and send it wherever he pleased, and he enclosed the Gonzaga genealogy. For my part, I consider any obligation and service I had with the Marquis broken, and in proof of this, I am re returning the genealogy of His Excellency. He informed him. Tell him that I have changed my mind and do not care to complete my poem in honor of a man who lets me starve and that Pietro Aretino will never lack patrons. And having written that letter, he was overcome by its finality and felt as wretched as if he had left Venice. Several weeks later, the Mantuan ambassador visited his French colleague and found that the terrible gossip had preceded him. An incident is ensued to which he felt it his duty to devote a detailed report. Learning from various sources of the gossip and bluster of Pietro Aretino, and how he threatened to talk of all the princes of Italy when he went to France, and how he meant to avenge himself with his accustomed arms on his excellency, who would afford him plenty of matter, and how he had already begun to nag his servants, saying much less than they deserved, he wrote, I found the said Pietro in the house of the French ambassador with Count Guido and the ambassador of Florence. These gentlemen began to laugh and joke about what he had told them before my arrival. Besides the matters concerning Mantua, the Florentine envy told me that the rascal had had the effrontery to boast that he was the cause of the dispute over the question of precedence between Mantua and Urbino, and that he had the power to injure me, which I knew to be a lie, since he had lost the goodwill of the Duke of Urbino ever since he wrote the sonnet beginning, The Duke Needs a Wall for a Corselet. I called the said Pietro into the presence of Count Guido and the Florentine and said that I wished him to hear what I had to say to him. I told him that as long as he had spoken honorably of my master, I had honored and loved him. But now that I heard that he had decided to change his tone, he would forfeit my friendship, and as I had always befriended him with our illustrious lord, so I would do the contrary now, and he would regret having offended a Marquis of Mantua. Hitherto, I added, I had persuaded myself that he had spoken of his excellency under stress because he loved him too well. But seeing him persevere in these provocations and abuse his friends and servants, I was forced to conclude that he meant what he said. To which he replied that he told the truth about his servants and friends, and that he would say whatever he pleased of his excellency, since he had nothing to do with him now and was no longer recognized as his servant, and that no man could injure him, and that he was not afraid of his excellency, and that by God he would continue to talk as he pleased. And then I told him that my master was in a position to injure him and anyone who dared to offend his honor, and that he did not show, and that he... Then I told him that my master was in a position to injure him and anyone who dared to offend his honor, and that he did not show him the respect that was his due, 
and that if he did what he threatened, he might fare worse than he foresaw and would not be safe even in paradise. And I turned my back on him in great anger, for we had been quarreling for some time, and I moved away and began to talk to a French ambassador of other matters. But the said Pietro looked very dejected and alarmed by what I had said, and when I left the room, he followed me and begged me not to write to my master of what he had said at all came of his love and jealousy, and he never meant to write or speak of him otherwise than with honor, as a prince who deserved it, and from whom he had received many benefits, though not so many as he deserved, for he deserved too many for the poem he had made in his honor. I thanked him and begged him, I, I thanked him and exhorted him to persevere in his good sentiments. The Marquis, he took an extremely serious view of the incident and threatened to suppress the said Pietro. This produced a startled gurgle by return post. I am Pietro Aretino, it said, your servant by nature, not by art, your bosom friend in burning affection and not in frigid bondage. And I remind you that if a tongue could wear out, mine would be threadbare by now with praising you, and that if your angelic goodness hates and despises me, it hates and despises your glorious self. No king, no pope, no emperor, but the Marquis of Mantua, incarnate in my soul, confounds me, not for fear of my life, but for love of his great merits. And I kiss your hand, if I am still worthy of doing so. Uh, <clears throat> your letter, the Marquis replied two weeks later, and the stanzas of your Marfisa, in which you praise my house, have given me the greatest pleasure. And I have read them with the utmost delight. I cannot deny that to hear myself and my family extolled by such choice and cultivated talents as yours gratifies me, as I know that you have few equals and no superiors in the art of writing. Oh, the ground was solid once more under his feet, but Aretino had suffered too much by the shock not to make his patron pay for it. He made him pay in the first place with a gown of black velvet lined with gold cloth and trimmed with gold braid, a shirt and a doublet of brocade to celebrate their reconciliation. Next, he ordered in return for these cast off clothes, a damascened dagger of the most costly and exquisite workmanship, which would require six months to make as a gift for the Marquis. And perhaps, he warned him, you will regard this as the most precious of all your precious possessions, if I am not completely bereft of judgment. The reckless generosity which he displayed when he had the means to indulge it was even more reckless when he lacked them, and he did not count the cost when it was a case of excelling his excellency and making him pay for it. Once more the stanzas of Marfisa began to flow, once more he begged for an amanuensis, as he was buried in a litter of rhymes of which he could make neither head nor tail, but the poem bored him. He had passed through too bitter an experience. He was wasting his talents on Federico Gonzaga. Why should he not aim higher and enlarge the scope of his poem to embrace the Pope and the Emperor? Why should he not make it a monument to his own fame and a vehicle uh, for recovering the favor of Rome? When the Marquis became impatient with his slow progress, he retorted by putting his patron to work. Since I have worn myself out with such fervor, making a book that will leave an everlasting memory of you and your family, he wrote him, your excellency must take the trouble to press the Pope for a brief and the, for, your Excellency must take the trouble to press the Pope for a brief and the Emperor for a privilegio, prohibiting the unlicensed printing of this book within their domains 
for the next 10 years. These favors, signore, are granted to anyone who asks for them and cannot be rightly refused to me, particularly as both his beatitude and his majesty are gloriously recalled in the Pope. It was true, no doubt, that he had given the Pope some cause for complaint in the past, but, but though I have nipped him in idle chatter in these compositions which will live, I exalt him fervently, and since I hope to be rewarded not by the princes, not by the press, I beg you not to deprive me of this profit, which is a small favor, but of much importance to me. If you do not condescend to do me this service, or if Caesar or Peter are unwilling to grant it, I shall write 20 stanzas and lampoon them <laughs> so properly that anyone who prints them will be excommunicated and ruined, so that Your Excellency will be doing a most pious deed in preventing such a scandal. I kiss your hands, and if I do not obtain what I ask, I shall say that my dagger, uh, like all arms that are given, breeds enmity. The dagger brought an immediate response. The Marquis knew the meaning of noblesse oblige, and as the eagerness with which the poet pressed for a copyright seemed to promise the speedy completion of the epic, he lent himself to the scheme and directed his ambassador at Bologna to broach the question to both sovereigns. The moment was auspicious. The Pope and the Emperor had met in Bologna to settle the peace of Italy, and the Marquis was anxious that the general amnesty should include Aretino. A naturally amiable man, he hoped that a reconciliation might reform the malice of that bitter tongue. His ambassador reported, however, that it is impossible to obtain anything for Aretino either from the Pope or the Emperor because both say that besides his past offenses, he has recently written a testament which is most insulting to both of them. When this reply reached the poet, he picked up the epic and carried it to the pawn shop. Then, his head still whirling, he dashed off a letter in which he vented his mortified feelings on the Marquis, and in exasperated confusion, his humiliation, his pride, his injury, his rankling grievances and pent-up gall burst forth pell-mell with the headlong effusion of a punctured bladder. Over and above all, he rued one thing. I never regretted anything so much as that, as that I asked you this favor, and your ambassador will testify that he had already sent off my request when I recalled it. As for the testament, he had not written it, he knew who had, and that if it was not written by one who eats his holiness's bread, I have crucified Christ. The copyright was nothing. I may lose a few scudi by this refusal, but my glory is not subject to briefs and I can dispense with them. What mortified him was to be misunderstood. I want no briefs or privilegios from anyone. They shall soon see who Aretino is. Genius is not subject to the pleasure or displeasure of princes. The Pope thinks that I deserve no favors. The world thinks I do. He knows very well that when I was with him, he loved me, for I am a rare man and an honest one, and one day I trust he will open his eyes to my glory. Whatever happens, I am his servant. Continue to use whatever means you think proper, Your Excellency, to defend the innocence of your servant. If you find that I have written it, if, if, um, uh, if you find that I have written the testament, cut me in a thousand pieces. I know who has written it, but I shall keep my mouth shut, lest I be a suspected of spite. But if he shut his mouth on one subject, he opened it wide on another. Signore mio, you are not only courteous, you are lavish with everyone. How can you be so close with me who adore you? When will you give me bread? When I am dead? Is it nothing to you? 
that a poem composed to glorify you and all who bear, have borne, or will bear your name should have to be pawned for 200 scudi to buy the bread I have eaten in writing it? I tell you what all Venice knows. And I thought when I sent you the dagger that you would give me enough to save me from shame. But my luck with you is even worse than with the Pope. I beseech you, send me in my dire need, oh, 50 scudi, you will save my life. Then he thought of the poem in Pawn, and that revived his fury. By the body of St. Francis, if I had the book in my hands now, as I have not, I would burn it if your excellency does not send me the monies. But I know I shall have them. <clears throat> and I need them to pay a part of the debt on the dagger, which is worth more by God than you appreciate. And I doubt whether you would have suffered what I have suffered on account of it. One month from now, I shall send you a saddle, the most stupendous thing that ever a king or an emperor laid eyes on and of more value in its kind than the dagger. And not even for this do I expect to receive so much as a shirt. May I lie in my gullet. Licked, sealed, spitted, and slapped. The letter was already on its way when, with a final expectoration, he scribbled a postscript to the Mantuan ambassador. Tell His Excellency that those who have seen my dagger and his gifts and compared them are no little amazed. Tell him the truth that I have been much blamed, and that is no jest. Well, it was too late to murder him. Mm -hmm. The Marquis was at a loss. It was ridiculous to resent him. Mm -hmm. The colossal impudence, the outspoken calculation, the wheedling importunity, the preposterous swagger and petulance of the man had the enormous and transparent candor of a child, or a buffoon, or an elementary natural force. One could not snub an aboriginal savage. He blunted rebuke. He was a moral primitive, whose cynical integrity made dignity, pride, delicacy, decency, meaningless, and irrelevant. He was too disarming to murder, too irrepressible to reform, and too impervious to tame. There was only one alternative, to ignore him. But after ignoring him unsuccessfully for eight months, nothing remained for the Marquis but to humor him. Aretino now realized, however, that he could not rely on the Marquis to reconcile him with Rome. About this time, Gilberti passed through Venice. The poet sought him out, threw himself at his feet, and obtained his forgiveness for the past. Naturally, he was not satisfied with so little, and he immediately wrote to the Marquis, announcing the reconciliation and begging him to write a letter of congratulation to Giberti and to intimate how much he would appreciate some tangible recognition from Rome for the merits of his poet. The tact which Aretino displayed on this occasion did not surprise the Marquis. He had ceased to be surprised by anything which Aretino might do. The acquisitive sense of that aboriginal was capable of anything, even of acquiring delicacy. And as Federico Gonzaga prided himself on his own tact, he was pleased to exercise it in behalf of his protege, if only to show him how such things were done among civilized people. He did as he was bid and wrote Giberti a choicely worded letter, which he sent by special courier to Verona. Giberti replied with sly malice and without haste. I am extremely gratified by the pleasure your Excellency professes to take in my reconciliation with Messer Pietro, and by your recondescending to consider it so important as to send me a courier expressly for that purpose. Being as I am your devoted servant, any little service of this sort will be agreeable to me, particularly one which you consider so great that henceforth I shall consider it such myself. 
When the Marquis read these words, he winced. An exquisite pang stung his civilized vanity. He had invited the snub by sponsoring a savage. Was it possible that Aretino had persuaded him to write that letter for the sole purpose of making him ridiculous? The Marquis went white at the thought. He suspected diabolical schemes everywhere. And he realized that his patronage of the poet was compromising him in the eyes of the world and that he was paying for his immortality with his dignity. His murderous instincts awoke. Then his eyes fell on the conclusion of Giberti's letter. In his own, he had alluded very tactfully and even sympathetically to the attempt on Aretino's life in Rome. The wording was consummate. While I believed that what you did against him was not done without good cause, yet I always hoped that your kindness and humanity would lead you to do what you have now done. But even the refined vagueness of that reference seemed a blunder in the light of Giberti's reply. There is a phrase in your letter which I cannot let pass, the bishop wrote, without begging you to rest assured that Whatever was done against him was done without my command, my consent, or my knowledge. On the contrary, I was so shocked that, had I not been dissuaded by infinite requests, I would have made a much greater demonstration than I did. The Marquis hastened to apologize for seeming to misjudge him, but on second thought he decided that he had not misjudged him after all. <laughs> Giberti had merely learned, like himself, that if the man could not be murdered, there was no alternative but to humor him, and consoled by that thought, he forgave the bishop his snub. With the poet, however, the Marquis became extremely guarded. He no longer alluded to his family epic. He no longer alluded to anything. <laughs> At 30, Federico Gonzaga was worn out with dissipation and almost a valetudinarian, and like an invalid, he began to care more for his comfort than his glory. He resigned himself to oblivion and found that, after all, it was perfectly comfortable. The poet, finding his patron unwilling or unable to promote his reconciliation with Rome, also lost interest in Marfisa, and began to cast about for other protectors. In Venice, he lacked influence, but he whistled and set to work. One thing he had learned, that to arrive anywhere, it was necessary to begin not at the bottom, but at the top. He began with the Doge. The Doge was pious. And to win his eye, the chameleon creature once more changed color. He had always advertised his contempt for the clergy and was repugnant to play the hypocrite, at least in public. But there was one priest in Venice whom he sincerely respected and who stood high in the favor of the Doge. Pietro Vergerio was one of a little band of Catholic reformers who hoped to stem the Lutheran menace by a judicious reform of the clergy. With these aims, Aretino found it possible to sympathize and he cultivated the reformer in private. But Aretino could conceal nothing, and Titian blinked at the change which came over his crony. Was this the man he had painted? Something was amiss. It was not his veracity, it was not his virtuosity, but his voluptuousness. He seemed to be ashamed of he had lost or mislaid his good cheer. Aretino blamed everything on his debts. He could not obtain credit. He expected to die on a bridge. Titian cocked his eye and surveyed the soul of the matter. Why was he starving himself? What did he expect to gain? The flesh and the soul were indissoluble. He had deceived no one but himself by such austerity. Aretino, Aretino shut his eyes and sighed. Even Titian misunderstood him. 
but he persevered. Pietro Vergilio was soon satisfied with his progress and recommended him to the Doge, and the Doge consented to intercede for him with the Pope on condition that Aretino delete all abuse of his holiness from his writings and that he confess, communicate, and mend his life. The poet solemnly took the pledge. In January 1530, the formal reconciliation of the emperor and the pope was solemnly celebrated in Bologna. It was an historic occasion. The dove of peace hovered, a bedraggled bird, over the peninsula. In the Duomo of Bologna, which had witnessed so many such scenes, Clement VII placed the iron crown on the head of Charles V. The emperor knelt, rose, and restored the pope to his temporal dominions, and as the pontiff went through the feeble motions of a nominal sovereignty, Italy lapsed into, into a servitude which was to last from the Renaissance to the Risorgimento. It was a piece of exhaustion, and it was fittingly celebrated. The Pope was worn out by ill health, humiliation, and the terrible experience of the sack. Nothing remained but his magnanimity, and when, amid the general dispensation of honors and indulgences, a petition in behalf of Pietro Aretino was presented to him in the name of the Doge, he relented. He had lost his long memory in the sack, he forgot everything connected with it, but there was only one way to forget Aretino. Accordingly, the pontifical victim of the Pax Romana bestowed on the penitent poet of the Pax Vobis his benediction and order of knighthood, the coveted brief for the Marfisa, and a promise of more substantial gifts to follow, and the emperor followed suit with an imperial knighthood and the privilegio. Little pride as he had left, Clement still prided himself on not misplacing his bounties, and he was deeply relieved, therefore, by the letter in which Aretino now acknowledged value received. Your majordomo, the Bishop of Vassone, he wrote, handed me the brief here in the palace of the Queen of Cyprus and repeated what he was commanded to say, i.e., that you were not so amazed at rising to the papacy from the rank of a mere knight of Rhodes or at being, um, I'm sorry, let me go back. Your majordomo, the Bishop of Vassone, he wrote, handed me the brief here in the palace of the Queen of Cyprus and repeated that he was commanded to say, i.e., that you were not so amazed as at rising to the papacy from the rank of a mere knight of Rhodes or at being <coughs> imprisoned when you were pope, as you were by my flaying your good name, particularly as I knew why you did not punish a certain person for attempting my life. Holy Father, in everything that I have ever written or done, my tongue has always been true to my heart, and in attacking your honor, I have always protested that I was not to blame for taunting you. If those who have attained the summits of power and honor through you insulted you with spears, what wonder that I taunted you with tittle-tattle? Two things I repent and am ashamed of. I repent, having censured a pope whose glory was always dearer to me than life, and I am ashamed that in censuring him I did so in the depths of his afflictions. Now I thank God that he has relieved your soul of the bitterness of offense and mine of the sweetness of revenge. And in future I shall be your good servant as I was in the days when my virtue, fostered by your praise, fought for you against Rome when Leo vacated the sea, and I will so conduct myself that the serenissimo gritti, whose perfect modesty is mediated between your patience and my rage, will have occasion to reward rather than punish me. Aretino was as good as his word. In Lent, the Mantuan ambassador met him in church with tears in his eyes and his confession in hand. In the dim light, the poet had difficulty in reading it, but he studied it devoutly, and when he raised his eyes, they were harrowing. 
and when he spoke, his voice was husky. The ambassador was so amazed at the change that he immediately reported to the Marquis. It was the events of the day in Venice. He told me that he knew God would not forsake him and that he would do him more good than he deserved, having been a great sinner, and that he had put an end to the life he was leading, being absolutely resolved to renounce his rancors and hatreds and the rest of his wicked ways, and that he was thoroughly contrite and that he would confess and communicate with his whole household, which he had not done for many years. On learning of this reform, the Marquis also was relieved. He looked forward now to a little peace himself and did not begrudge the poet, his divine patron. No more was said on either side of the Marfisa. It remained in pawn. Aditino was too busy living the poem of the pure in heart to remember his epic. He had served its, it had served its purpose. It had brought him a contrite heart and a sincere conviction of the vanity of human glory, including his own, and his one concern now was to redeem his soul. It was still in pawn. He did not haggle with heaven. He spent Lent communicating, confessing, dieting, mumbling, and mortifying himself, and when he appeared once more in public, the doge congratulated himself on having won a soul and rendered a public service to the city. On a memorable afternoon in April 1530, in the hall of the Grand Council in the Ducal Palace, Aretino publicly presented his soul to the Doge and the assembled Senate and acknowledged his debt to the city which had redeemed him. The gorgeous hall, fretted with gold, transfigured with frescoes, filled with ambrosial sun, and the flickering shimmer of the lagoon resounded to a grandiose harangue which the poet pronounced it with the sonorous se serenity and the grandiose avowal of a man reading his naturalization papers in paradise. I, who in the liberty of this great state have learned at last to be free, repudiate courts forever and here build the everlasting tabernacle of my advancing years, for here there is no place for betrayal. Here the cruelty of harlots cannot rule, nor the insolence of Ganymedes. Here a favor cannot prevail over right. Here there is neither theft, nor violence, nor murder. And therefore, he concluded his inaugural apostrophe, I, who have terrified the wicked and protected the good, Give myself to you, who are the fathers of your people, the brothers of your servants, the children of truth and friends of virtue, the comrades of strangers, the pillars of religion, the custodians of faith, the ministers of justice, the heirs of charity, and the subjects of clemency. Then, with a sweeping and synonymous movement of fluent, fluent obeisance, he turned to the doge. Illustrious prince, he declared, illustrious prince, gather my love in the lap of your compassion, that I may praise the nurse of all other cities and the mother elected of God to glorify the world to moderate manners, to moderate manners, and to give humanity to men, and to humble the proud, pardoning the erring. Such, he declared with a gesture which filled the room with vast rhetorical fresco, such is its privilege to usher in peace and to end wars. And then, his vision broadened and his pacific inspiration raised the roof. Therefore, the angels lead their dances and assemble their choirs and spin their wheels of light over the field of air above it. Extending the ordinances of its laws and the length of its life beyond the terms prescribed by nature. O oh, universal fatherland, O oh, common liberty, 
Oh, station of the scattered! How much greater were the woes of Italy were your goodness less! Here is the refuge of her peoples, the security of her riches, the safeguard of her honor, the embraces. <coughs> Here is the refuge of her peoples, the security of her riches, the safeguard of her honor. She embraces her when others abuse her. She supports her when others abase her. She welcomes her when others expel her and feeds her when others starve her and cheering her in her tribulations sustains her in love and charity. And associating himself with the celestial city and identifying himself with its destiny, he stood inhaling its sovereign independence and exhaling his own triumphant emancipation. Be more, O Rome, for here there are none who could or would tyrannize over liberty. That douchebag. <laughs> he worked at it, man. He really worked at it. He really worked at it. Tell me something. In the language that the, is that modern language, or is that really early? Uh, that's early 20th century, late 19th century English. That's it's practically Shavian. When, when was this book written? Or well, translated? The 30s. In the 30s? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, that's. that's so yeah. he, he integrated the new language, the new translating language. the old language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Putting different words in there that has yeah. finally come into existence, these new words. I noticed it. there's a lot of new words in there that simply doesn't go back to that age. Because there's no association to those words. Well, like what? Age. For example? Um, some of the symbolic words, you know, that, that addresses some other issue. How those words are used to address other issues or name other situations. That may be possible. I mean, because when you translate something, of course, you use the language of your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, not yeah. the language of the time. Yeah, uh, you yeah. know, if you're translating a, an Italian piece from the Renaissance, yeah. You trans and you're translating it now in the 21st century, you use yeah. 21st century English, not Renaissance English, because it would sound stupid if you used Renaissance English. What do you mean by that? Well, if you, if you translated Aretino uh, and made it sound like Chaucer or Spencer, Spencer, more like Spencer than Chaucer, it, it would be like, yeah, so why, why are you doing this? You know, it's not comprehensible, it's not, it doesn't make sense and stuff. But if you put it in modern... It was lagging it's, yeah. in terms of conversation. Plus, There's more thought applied to the thought right. rather than outward speaking about what you want to say. Yeah. Plus, there's the fact that... Is that Jack Kennedy? No. Who is that? That looks... That's the guy. The shape of his head. Could be. Yeah, could be. That was the moment way back when. Oh. Um, Not Morgan, but Museum, Metropolitan Museum. Oh, oh right. It was about 19... Well, you can say it's Kennedy. Yeah. Uh. President Kennedy, that's if, you know, that's before he got murdered. Yeah. And he was thinking about going down to Texas. All right. <laughs> he looked nice. Should have stayed at the museum. <laughs>